Thanks for listening to the Music Production Podcast. One of the best ways to keep up with my work is by joining the Music Production Club. My Music Production Club gets you access to my latest creations as soon as they're released. You also get exclusive packs, presets, samples, and templates that only come with the Music Production Club membership, as well as educational materials such as my books and my video courses. And then there's bonus materials you get just for joining. There's also a community of like-minded producers, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. In our Discord, we help each other make music, share tips and tricks, inspirations. We also have our live meetings online over Zoom. And during those meetings, we have some sort of musical challenge, and we spend the first hour making music and the second hour sharing our music. And I want to show you some music we made in one of our last meetings. The parameters to our challenge for this meeting were to use my Ghosts Ableton Live Pack, my Trip Hop Drums Ableton Live Pack, the Dank Verb Impulse Responses from Perform Module. Those are all included with your Music Production Club membership. And to use a scale you don't normally use that you're kind of unfamiliar with. Now I'd like to let you hear some of the music that we made during this live meeting. Here's a track called Aurora by Trev Phonic. And here's part of a jam from Psychotronic Squirt Gun. And this track was made by Sicken during the meeting. This track is by Animus Invidious called Bazoo Flap. And here's what I made during our meeting. I used the whole tone scale. We all made these songs in about 45 minutes and then shared them with each other. And it's so cool that we had each other to kind of lean on to motivate ourselves to do these tracks, to work together. And to hear what everyone made was so much fun. So much diversity in the sounds, all done with the same parameters but totally different results. I'm really grateful to have a community of people that I can make music with like this. If you want to be part of this, check out the Music Production Club. Go to brianfunk.com slash mpc. Hello, welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Amanda Cauley. Amanda is an award-winning orchestral composer for film, television, and video games. She's worked on some recent projects, including the documentary Visionary Gardeners, the animated series Fireman Sam, and a new video game, Siege Breaker. Amanda's here to talk about her process, some of the projects she's working on, and I'm excited to get a little peek into her world of creating worlds for film, media, television, video games. Amanda, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Brian. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's really nice to have you. Um, I've listened to some of your work um, in preparing for this, and I really love how it's so centered to what you do is like creating this world. And that comes up a lot in some of the, the materials on your, on your website and stuff about character building, world building. And I always think about that too, just even from like a songwriting and music production perspective, how it's so important to sort of bring our listeners somewhere 
into some、mm. kind of like sonic world that sort of triggers the imagination, and、um, your work depends on that. So,、uh, yeah, I'm just、mm. excited to talk to you about that and what I can learn about bringing that into songwriting and things I like to do, and people listening might be into as well. So、Absolutely, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely, the world of film and TV and video games is so imaginatory. Like, there's so much space there to expand and build these worlds because a lot of them don't exist in our reality. So,、mm. um, it's nice to create music for these different palettes and thinking about unique places and ways to expand the、uh, suspension of belief and and imagination to take you on these journeys. Right, yeah. I mean, even if you go back to like the old video games, Super Mario World, Legend of Zelda,、um, th- those games really immerse you in those in those worlds with just really simple melodies and very, you know, you're using an orchestra from a lot of your work. It seems like, but、um, you know, they had like the four or five channels of sound, and still, it's such an integral part to the experience. Yeah. Absolutely, and those themes really stay with you. Like I've just found the the community in video games, like the、um, they're they're so loyal, and listening out for the soundtrack and and the the music just really elevates the whole theme of the, of the game. And、um, yeah, that's something that always inspired me, and one of the reasons that I kind of got into this whole industry.、Mm. How did you get into that industry? What, what,、uh. <laughs> there must be some kind of strange turn of events, I'm sure. Is、For video games specifically,、um, yeah, or sure, just composing, yeah, yeah, really, so... because、uh, it's funny how it seems chaotic at the time, but sometimes you look back and you're like, oh yeah, there's a clear path that makes sense. Yeah, there. There is a path, but it's so different for everybody, and that's the really interesting thing. Is there's just really no one way to break into the industry, and everyone's path is going to look so different. And you really can't tell how it's going to look. Like reflecting back, I'm like, oh wow, like I can see how certain things led to other things, but、mm. um, there's no way to predict predict that. So a lot of it was being open minded to new opportunities.、Um, I've only just started composing for video games in this last year. This was a, a totally new experience. I've always been in the film and TV kind of genre and industry,、um, and I started there because I I just always knew、um, from probably like eight years old that I wanted to be a composer for film and media because、wow. I was obsessed with soundtracks. I would watch a film and. I would listen to the soundtrack over and over again after, and just get lost in the music and do whatever I could to learn more about it and dissect the score. And、um, that's something that it just like it, I always resonated with it. It was always my place of home, and because the world was so well built with all these characters and everything, it it felt like such an exciting place to. Dive into that music, and it would instantly transport me. And it was there for me throughout my whole life, through the ups and the downs.、Um, and I always knew that I wanted to create that experience for others、um, to take them on journeys and be able to go into these fantasy worlds of creation. And、um, <laughs> so I, I just kind of like beelined for it, which was.、Um, Really, a privilege, I would say, to know what I wanted to do from such a young age,、um, because I kind of saw any opportunity that helped me get to my goal. I saw it as a stepping、mm. stone, and so I was really kind of aware. And once you have a goal,、um, I feel like it's easier to see, like, okay, yes, this this one project is going to help me get there, or no, maybe this is going to take me away from it. So just having that, like, that goal, I feel really helped me with manifesting. What I would like to create around me. So I I did study、um, music outside. Like once I finished high school, I studied at the University of Victoria classical music and then、uh, contemporary music at Selkirk College in Nelson, BC. And、um, there just developed a lot of the hard like hard and soft skills. You know, program softwares and mixing and all of those skills that you need to to carry out、um, to create these these different. Palettes, and、um, that's where. Right after that, I basically went to my first film festival, and 
introduced myself as a composer and just started Hmm. taking interest in what other people were doing and finding people that were making projects that I was really excited about, watching their films and then engaging with them and going up to them and talking to them about their film. And I found that was um, the biggest and easiest way to get in was to connect with someone over something that they're already building and doing and loving and Mm. sharing the love for that. So I went to my first festival. I just put on a little business suit, passed out business cards. Um, I was 19 years old and I was just like, I'm a film composer. And, you know, I I got my first project out of that. I started working on a documentary gardening TV series called Ageless Gardens. And it was, you know, it's it's kind of the fake until you make it. You have those, you have the skills, you know you are a composer. You just you don't have the credits, right? So yeah. for me, it was just kind of about owning it, going into film festivals, connecting with um indie films and documentaries and and people that were creating these these things that I I, I really resonated with and just diving into it and trusting that um I would figure it out. If I didn't know what I was doing, I would figure it out on the journey. And that was something that, yeah, it was definitely uncomfortable at times, but I I knew that that's kind of what it would take and to put myself in the situations just to, um, just to get, get the opportunity to, to grow. And I just really strongly believe um, it was David Bowie who said, just always be slightly outside of your comfort zone just always be slightly out of your depth and just then you're in the place to do something interesting so I'm always someone that I uh yeah I jump without considering all of the things and I figure it out how how to how to go along the way sometimes but it's really helped me grow yeah you figure out the landing when you're getting to the thing, yeah <laughs> you worry about the landing later right yeah yeah i was thinking i mean it's that's kind of a brave thing to do especially at a young age like that to just show up and be like i'm a composer and here's my card and yeah, yeah maybe i haven't done it yet but that's what i do <laughs> i'm on my exactly way. Yeah. exactly and it's not i mean it's not the, the way for everyone i mean the, the most traditional way that i think composers see the root is like to to become an assistant right to shadow someone and to learn and and for me that just that that opportunity wasn't quite there because um I didn't want to move to LA I wanted to stay in Canada and stay close to Vancouver Victoria is where I was living at the time and um and so it just made more sense for me to to just start building my own credit slowly and just I was just like I'm just going to build this from the ground up and I've got a a long career ahead and I'm in no hurry to get there I'm going to just enjoy all the steps along the way of of building this yeah right you think there's some advantages to not going to where everyone goes like everyone goes to LA for Mm. you know anything in film especially it's such a common move for anyone in the arts I guess yeah. But um yeah, I think it could be ad- advantageous like um there's so many composers, there's so many emerging composers. So yes, there are more opportunities, but the pool if of of people trying to 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 win those opportunities and is is way way larger and um so I'm not sure you know, I'm I'm sure I would still be composing if I did go to LA and I would have just had a a, diff- a slightly different journey, but I'm not sure that it's the way or the right way for everyone but also the the journey that I took wouldn't wouldn't be the right Mm -hmm. choice for for everyone too I think it really depends on your personality and on on what you feel like is the right thing to do and what you're comfortable with um but I would say that being in BC, um, there's been lots of opportunities. There's lots of funding and grants and programs that are trying to get composers out there and, and help emerging um, mm-hmm. artists get established, um, musicians too. You know, we've got lots and lots of funding for albums and things like that. So um, I find that where I live in British Columbia, there's quite a lot of support for that, which is I'm really grateful for. Right. Yeah, that's cool. I, I would think because... It's just another landscape to work within, and especially if it's something, the place you like like that. Um, yeah. What were the, I mean, eight years old is so young to know anything. That's not, <laughs> like, that's not like, I want to be Batman, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like to have like an actual, like, because, and especially I think like a composer for film is kind of, to me, seems like a really weird one for an eight-year-old it's to have. It's a little niche, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> what yeah. was um, what were some of the movies that got you excited that made oh. you think about that? <laughs> were you already playing an instrument or anything at that I point? I started playing piano at that point. That that uh-huh. was right around when I um I started playing piano. I uh, recorded my first album when I was ten. I remember my dad helped me. He bought some XLR <laughs> cables, microphones, took them in my stuck them in my piano and. Wow. and Set me up with a Cubase software, um, which I don't work in anymore, probably because I tried to when I was 10 and it wasn't clicking. (laughs) Um, um, But yeah, I did like really just dive in from a young age. And and, and my dad was so supportive of this journey. He's Mm. he's um, I think he's got a real like artistry in him himself. Um, But yeah, some of the films, I mean, there's just so many like some of the very, very first would be like the Lion King. And it's a little bit of a cliche, but it was just one of those ones that uh, it's just it was so deep and meaningful. And the music just moved me. I just remember crying yeah, all the yeah. way through the film. I could never get over the death of Mufasa. <laughs> like even when they're right. singing Akuna Matata. I was it was just so beautiful. It was so haunting. And I really connected with it. And um, so I think it, and then it just kind of spiraled. And um, I, I knew I wanted to be a, a composer. And I think throughout like growing up and <clears throat> realizing that it was always film music that I was drawn to. It wasn't just music, it was film music. And I think a lot of it was the hybrid of, I, I love the sound of the orchestra. I love all the instruments, um, but I don't I don't love classical music always. I, I appreciate it, and but I, I don't really love just listening to symphonies and, and, and a lot of classical. And, and so I think film was the first place that I heard the orchestra being used in a contemporary sense. And, mm. you know, like you can actually hear like the, the chord progressions and Hans Zimmer's like lying. And you can hear like the contemporary side of it. And for me, I think that's what really drew me in is it had these things that were really accessible for me from a really young age. It didn't feel like too intellectual or too anything. I just felt um, like I understood it. And I think that's why... It, it appeals to me, like film music in, in particular and soundtracks, game soundtracks. And yeah. Right. Yeah. The the Lion King. What, what a great movie. Great soundtrack. <laughs> a lot of those Disney movies that came out around that time were just yeah. really like I, I was a kid, like when Aladdin came out and it was like so much fun to hear that soundtrack. We had it at yes. home. We'd listen to it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's kind of weird. It's, um I didn't think of it the same way I thought of bands. You know, it was it was like a different thing, even though it was still music and songs. Mm. But it was something different. And um, for me, that you know, that never seemed like something I would do or would be able to do. But it's yeah. interesting how you know, just different people. It's so cool. Your dad was that supportive. You know, getting you like set up yes. this stuff to record. He was. Both my parents were incredibly yeah. supportive and. That's so powerful um, to for them to see like the passion that I had for music and for them to just encourage that. Like they had no fear of like a career in music, you know, like yeah. you can't, you know, most and a lot of parents. I had a lot of musician friends and uh, they that, that love music, too. And, and they would ne- never consider it as a career because it just didn't it didn't fit. And, and their parents really discouraged it. Um, and and I think that's quite a common tale. But but my parents. um they were just they just saw the passion in me and they just did everything they could to encourage that and um yeah i just am so grateful that they did that because who knows hmm. who knows where what i would have been doing yeah I, i'm lucky like that too um when i got interested in the guitar electric guitar and they did not care for much of the music i was listening to but <laughs> they were really supportive in that and we would eventually have band practices in our basement there yeah and, um, <laughs> I know there was a small part of them that liked that because they knew what we were up to and where we were because they could obviously hear us. But yeah, uh, I still kind of can't believe that they allowed all of that because yeah. <laughs> we were always in the basement making all kinds of noise. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, yeah. we had no concept of like respectable volumes either. We would just... Mm, just you know, crank it. And, just crank and it, yeah. rock out, right. yeah. That's amazing. It's it's invaluable. It's so cool to have that experience. Yeah, it really is, and uh, forever grateful for that. And and it's it's nice to see how that, in your case too, just helped you get along this way. And you yeah. spoke about having the goal and the vision, and mm. I think that's such a great point. In that, 
you start to see like, this is bringing me towards my goal. This is bringing me away. And there's yeah. kind of like no standing still. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're yep. pretty much going one way or the other. Yep, and that's right. Gives you that perspective to just know, okay, this yep. is worth doing, this is not. And um, various points in my life, I've tried to take that perspective and it, it is very mm -hmm. helpful to just- Yeah, it does. It really helps and- Sometimes you have to um, prioritize things, and sometimes you know mm. there there are things that come up that conflict, or you just you can't do it all. And uh, that's something that I'm just just kind of starting to learn and figure out how to navigate is um, when the opportunities start calling, like you know, trying to manage that and and manage what you're capable of outputting because it's a, it's a creative thing, and that's something to be a little bit sensitive of too because it's not like we can just output output output, you know, and it. It's it's creative. We need to refill our cup. We have to be engaged. We have to feel connected. Um, and that, that, that's part of my process anyway. That's something that's really important to me. So lately, I've, I've just really realized that that's something that sometimes now I need to, to make sure I consider that I can fully commit to any project that I take on and I'm going to be there for it creatively. And um, and so that's why it really helps to just think like, is this in line with with my goals? This is exciting. Do I want to work with these people? Is this is this um, going to help me, you know, and, and am I excited about this project? Mm -hmm. And that I feel like once you kind of start looking at those questions, it makes it easier to make decisions. Um but yeah, definitely. I'm someone that just, I just committed to it. There definitely was a time like straight out of um, university where I just said to myself, I'm going to do, I'm going to do anything, but it has to be music related. So I was just determined. I'm not going to just take a job as a waitress, you know, if I need to, like, I'm going to um, keep it in music because at least then I'm still going to be learning, expanding my knowledge in music. And, mm. and I did that. And I definitely did some careers that I, I didn't love, like wedding DJing. And, oh, um, no. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I, you don't just kind of hit a spot on me because I've had, I've done a few <laughs> recently that, as favors and oh, okay, yeah. very glad I could help, but it yeah. was, it was not, uh, I was not the right guy for the job. And... No, no. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's like state in music. Maybe I learned I learned more about audio rigs, and I, I got some really great yeah. speaker systems because of that. I, I could um, probably, and, in yeah. my optimistic uh, mindset, maybe find a few find things. a positive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And um, and there were a lot that I loved too. Like I, I taught piano for 10 years and absolutely loved that, that side mm. of things. And it's something that I've had to step out of recently because there just has, hasn't been space for it alongside composing anymore. Um, but it's, it's been really nice to explore different. And I gigged as a live musician um, for years as well, doing three nights a week and playing with bands and, and doing little trips for little tours. And, and so that's, I, you know, I just kind of, I felt like I've grown a lot just by keeping it music related. It hasn't always been film related, mm -hmm. but I think everything that I've done has, has given, learned, just given me more skills and more depth and, and appreciation for the projects that I do really love. And when I get to compose, it's like, yeah, I know I'm doing what I, what I really want to do now. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah there's definitely some value in, garnering experiences and because sometimes things surprise you too you realize oh wow i like this i didn't know i was going to like that mm, yeah and it kind of strengthens you in other ways um and in, in a lot of those types of things um but it is tricky when because sometimes there are some like pretty neat opportunities that come up that are fun and interesting and exciting and or maybe they're like pay finally they pay you know so you're like yeah. oh boy but um if you if if you're not careful it can kind of lead you down and distract you from like the things you really want to be doing yeah it, it's a tricky yeah. balance because it is nice to say yes to a lot of things yes. but it's it i guess once you have that vision you know then it's time yeah. to really focus i was down. always a yes person always a yes person and, and like i said it's just been recently that uh, I think kind of last year I, I reached a burnout and I was just like, I realized that by saying yes, 
I was also saying no to myself. Like by saying yes to everyone else, I was saying no to having a walk with my dog and time with my husband and time to do the things that I need to do. Because I was just doing too many projects, trying to stretch myself too thin, trying to say yes to everything. And so, um, so that's just something I've considered now. And just reframing it that way. It's like, I'm saying yes. Sometimes by saying no, you're actually saying yes to something else. You know, you're creating space to, um, to really commit to to something else and um it's hard it's hard to do that it's really hard to find balance in this industry Mm -hmm. it's just there's so much hurry up and wait time you know it's like and everything is contract based so you always have these spaces between and it's like you've got to just keep keep trusting that you're on the right path and and something will come up and fill fill that space and so um yeah it's it's a learning mm. process and I'm just at the start of that just just starting to find balance saying yes to one thing is saying no to everything else I think if yeah. if you're a person that's doesn't like to say no to things that's a good way to think about it because mm-hmm. it is important to get that balance and to realize like yes you want to do this thing maybe you don't want to say no but you are also pushing all those other things away that you could be doing exactly yeah. Yeah. So you've got like a like a band set up behind you. I kind of <laughs> asked you a little bit before we started, but I wanted to I do. find out what you're up to there because that looks like it might be some other kind of project that's going it on. It is. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. I am in a. It doesn't look like orchestra <laughs> composing to me. It looks Not more. <laughs> looks more like what's right behind me. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is, this is my my jam space, and uh, I am also in a progressive rock band called Telosia. <sighs> Uh, with my husband, he plays the drums and two of nice. our, our best mates. And uh, yeah, it's it's really it's been really fun. It's just kind of like a fun thing. We get we get together and jam. We just actually released an album um, last month. Um, it's a really unique genre because we all come from different backgrounds. I have this very orchestral um you know, soundscape kind of capability. Mm. And then our lead guitarist, uh, Matt Lazar, he's comes from like a metal background. And then my husband, uh, Tyler is a, um, like math rock, like really technical, really yeah, progressive. Wow. And, <laughs> and our bass player is like really like groovy and, you know, like, um, locked in. And, and so it's just, we came together, we just started jamming. It was a fun project. And, um, we just have this really like people will ask us what is your genre and I I just say pro- progressive rock because that kind of progressive en- encompasses so much but it's really got orchestral elements and like, like there's you know I recorded live strings for the album as well um, and we've we've got so much so it's really fun to actually just play music so that's something I mm. missed a little bit of like you, we get we get locked in in our in our computers like as a composer I'm I'm working um, in my computer most of the time every day you know t- 10 hours a day and and we don't really see the outside world and um it's just it's nice to create music in real time that's just something that i i still appreciate doing yeah. and it's just there's no pressure attached to it there's no like we want to tour the world or we want to you know it's just like we're just making music and having fun with it and it's a nice little outlet well, what's it called Telosia. how do you spell that yeah, T E L. I'll put in the show notes. T E L. O S I A. So it's an interesting word. We actually kind of made it up. It comes from the word telos. Telos is a Greek word um, that means to strive for um, your full potential, to reach your full potential. So, um, so telosia is uh, this this thing that we created because uh, I think like kind of like Fantasia kind of like played into it. Like we wanted it to feel um, like otherworldly and fantastical (laughs) and like it doesn't quite belong here (laughs) so i I think uh i think it does kind of encompass our style but um yeah i think prog rock is probably the only genre that you could fit all those different types of musical (laughs) personalities in (laughs) yeah i mean i'm interested to hear uh, anyone wants to share their feedback i'm always interested to hear how it hits people the reception to the album has been this is our first album that we've just released we haven't um really released music yet before that and the reception's been great so far we're actually just like kind of blown away by um 
by how how much it's been listened to already. So it's been it's been really cool. It's just experimental for us. We have no idea how this is gonna hit people. It might just be like people might just be like, "What is this?" You know, if you try to be too many genres, you're not any one genre. Yeah. But that's the thing is, <laughs> is we're not really trying to be any anything. It's just it's just eclectic because because of who we all are as a band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's so cool. And you make such a good point. Somewhere, <laughs> I guess probably around like the year 2000 and the next couple of years, music became so much more a solitary thing, especially for me too, around that time. I'm, it was always playing in bands, but then it got into recording and then soon recording got into recording onto the computer mm. where you can do everything. And it it became kind of solitary and i've played in bands more or less my entire life since i started doing music but there was probably a few years there where i wasn't and Mm. it was i mean it was great i got to do everything i wanted i didn't have to compromise on anything and you know you get all the parts that go exactly the way i wanted them to yeah and over the last few years, I've again started playing with some people, two of my best mm-hmm. friends, and um, we've had a lot of fun just making stuff together. And even just our last practice, we were talking about how when you're playing with other people, if I'm playing a guitar part or whatever, the other parts are starting to happen around me in real yeah. time. Whereas if I'm yeah. by myself, I sort of have to like put the whole guitar part down and then go to the drums and then go to yeah. the bass and see if they work and then yeah. find out that I have to adjust something here or there so that they groove properly. <laughs> it's totally. so nice to have that real time kind of coming together happening as Absolutely. you're Absolutely. And I feel like we all influence each other, you know, like mm-hmm. Tyler will just do a little like something on the drums and I'll be like, that was a cool rhythm. And I'll start playing it as a melody. And then like our bassist will catch on and, and we all just, we're all listening. And that's mm. what it is, is it's communicating with each other. It's like, we're having a conversation when we're just jamming and um, you know, it's like, if someone plays a cool lick and then one of us will like actually like repeat it and then we'll kind of like get hooked on it and we're like, oh, it's like, I'm vibing with what you're saying. That's cool. Let's continue on that. And I think those things just just don't um, come up as organically like when you're looping and just adding everything yourself because you're just thinking about each instrument like as it as you're working on it, um, whether it's we we were kind of like I feel like there's things that I just wouldn't have thought of on my own. It's just yeah. like it was just influenced because I just did that, and then they responded with this, and then we were like, "Whoa, that that actually was really cool together." Um, but obviously, there's I mean, there's lots of pros to doing the looping thing as well. It's it's just really like what 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 is your way of communicating with music? And for me, it's it's that collaboration, and that's just something that um, I think is really cool. It's like it's bigger than what I could have just imagined it to be on its own. It's like, it's everyone's, it's everyone's product. We've all imagined something and contributed and, and we're kind of a unique band in that we write every song together, all together in the room together. Um, And I just, I just think like a lot of, a lot of bands, you know, work with like, there's a, a lead singer or, or guitar player that comes in with an idea and they're like, okay, here's the idea. Let's work on this. Like we don't really start with anything. We, we really just do like open jams and we, we, um, yeah, we just, we write every, and, and I mean, it, ta- it takes, it takes maybe longer to, to get the cohesiveness. It's not as direct, but, um, I think it's just really fun and really exploratory mm. and we land on some really unique things that we wouldn't have just if we just did it stayed in our own spaces and worked that way so yeah, yeah it's been nice we kind of have a similar unwritten rule where we yeah. make everything together all the oh, songs cool. generally spawn out of some kind of jam playing yeah. around with chords and rhythms and stuff um, like I'm not bringing songs and the other guys write songs too. They don't bring them for the band. Um, not that it, it can't be that way, but yeah, there's just something like you said, when, when we all get together, I mean, it could even be, I could literally come up with every part while they are there, but I wouldn't come up with those parts that way if they mm. were, weren't there. Yeah. Um, it's like the smile maybe like when you say something you know so we're like trying to make up words and melodies or or just the change in the chords it's like yeah yeah (laughs) something like yeah 
And you know when it's so not working. Important. You know when it is working and you know when it's yeah. not working. Because you're like, oh, no one really responded We're to not that. Like, like, let it let it go. Rather than going down the rabbit hole of trying to develop it yeah. more. And, you know, if it's not really something that's sticking. I yeah. love that because it's, it's like the music is, 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 I guess, like it's not precious. It's just... Yeah. For one, like when I mean, we do record everything, it's so easy to record stuff, so I just hit record. But it's so in the background that you know, we don't even know that it just runs for the three hours or whatever we play, yeah. Um, but everything is just kind of like if it comes through, sometimes it just never happens again, it fades out, and other times it's like, no, let's kind of let's get this one, let's catch mm -hmm. it, you know, let's put yeah. it together. And yeah. I just love that when you've you can tell it's bouncing off of each other it's almost just the perfect like test you don't get that yeah. when you're by yourself no where, you don't i mean i'm sure you know no offense but you you probably have this feeling too where sometimes you make a song and the next day you're like what was i thinking oh yeah you know <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think everybody has that so yeah at least you get sort of that instant feedback of like, uh, nah, let's just let's keep playing till we find something yeah, else. <laughs> totally. And it really matters who it is in the band. Like I've I've been in a few different bands and I just this is the first time we're just like we're all really good friends and there's so much respect for each mm. other and there's so much um vulnerability there and that's so important because you know you, you've got to really like it's got to be a safe space to express yourself yeah. and we 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 jam every week and um we're always feeling different like so, sometimes it's like we're you know we're, we're not feeling inspired but but then we write something kind of melancholy and then it like jazzes us up and we're like oh that that's right so it's just like meeting each other where you're at too and mm. um and that's that's really nice, just kind of going into it with this trust and this little expectation, and just see what happens. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And you make a great point, like being close friends. And I mean, obviously, your husband's in the band, so yeah. this, the the relationships are more important than the music. It's, it's something so I've true. really come to learn. It's and so I, th true, I yeah. think looking back at times in my musical past, the it wasn't how I was operating. It was like, no, the song, the song. And like, you know, never mind. Yeah. I don't care if your feelings are hurt. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but really like the relationships are, that's what's cool about it. You know, like mm -hmm. when you find the right people and you can actually get vulnerable and whether it's silly or, or kind of, let out something that's you don't share with a lot of other people it's um oh it's just so nice to have that even if the music didn't come out of it yeah to, to be able to go there sometimes the music is just the vehicle that allows you to get that stuff out and have those conversations you know during mm. breaks or whatever um yeah yeah i, I think Absolutely. that's just such a nice I, I, it's like you, what you said about the goals. I really like this idea of these sort of um, guiding principles to keep in mind. Yeah. And, and that's one I, I always try to remember is like the relationship's so much more important. Like yeah. I could really decide like I need the, that bass fill can't be there. <laughs> I could fight mm -hmm. this battle or I could like have a friend, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Not, I just pick bass randomly, but yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's a decision to make and it's good to have those again you you're either moving towards it or away from it yeah and this battle might be moving you away from this relationship <laughs> yeah definitely yeah oh yeah there's there's not much space for ego and that's i think that's yeah. why in our band like it all works like we're all just like you know even if we're like oh this is this is really cool but then if, if most of us are like no like and you definitely have that when you're writing an album there's so many decisions when you when you're producing an album um and we worked our producer Jordan Chase was incredible. He was like, he's one of those producers that really dived into every song. Was like, Does this need to be here? Should this be here? Let's make the song better, you know. Like, and so we all just like it, it's just like once you drop your ego and you're like, let's just let the music be the best it can be, and it doesn't matter if I get my way or he gets his way mm. or like whose idea it was or it's just kind of about like letting the music serve its its purpose and just getting out of the way of that and definitely in the world of film and video games and television mm. there's no space for ego um you are there 
to serve the project. As a composer, I am I am here to elevate um, and to help support this world that's already been created. And it doesn't matter about my way. Like there is no my way. It's totally collaborative. And it's it's there is just the ego just doesn't doesn't serve at all. And so even if I write something that I really, really love and then show it to a director and they go, um, I don't know if that it's like you just have to go, okay, yeah, let's start, let's start again. Like let's let's really nail it down. Like what 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 is it that we we're not it's not working here? And like what and there's just like just letting go of that piece um has always helped me be, be more successful with the end piece of the music. Um so that's that's just something that I've kind of learned to realize is like it's not about me. It's never about yeah. me. <laughs> and it's it's nice to be part of something that's bigger than me and mm. collaborative. And I've just always been really excited about the outcome. It's always been better than what I just thought I was capable of myself. Like it's always better after it goes through this process and collaboration. And so yeah, I I really love it. I really love getting to collaborate um, through through art, through film, through music. Mm. Yeah, it's I guess especially obvious when you're talking about films. I mean, look at the credits of any movie these days. It's it takes as long as the movie takes to play all the credits. Oh, There's so gosh. many people involved. Yeah, that it it can't be anything else. And no. even um, yeah, from like releasing albums on my own and then releasing with bands when you when you do it with other people you have that shared glory that you just kind of mm -hmm. don't get by yourself even yeah. if you've worked so much harder and longer on the project of your own it's there's there's kind of nothing like being like hey we did that and like yeah right, isn't celebrating cool? together yeah. yeah high five yeah exactly yeah. nice job definitely definitely yeah. oh my gosh yeah i am I have so much appreciation for like what goes into building films. And um, I've just, I've just come back from spark animation this morning. I was at the festival this weekend and um, we just released a, um, a short film there and it was the world premiere ostinato and had some panel discussions. And I just got to observe the industry and learn about all the different at things that go into animation the teams that build it the like every single layer and level and and seeing getting to deep dive into like the nitty-gritty and, and going to to panels about you know like lighting effects on like one specific and you realize like how many hours have gone into creating one minute of of a hmm. final product like how many people like how many like it's just it's just extraordinary and when you get that perspective you really just think yeah like i I don't, I can't hang on Humbling. to what I yeah. think is yeah. right. <laughs> you really do feel like I want to serve this greater thing. Mm -hmm. I really want to like, to fit into this thing and, and, and make it, you know, shine. And it's not, it's just, it's just not about putting your own, your own spin or your own voice on. It's just really about like just serving it. And so um, I think when you start to get to see, see what goes into it, um, it's, it's really easy to, to just forget about ego and just say yeah there's there's a lot that has been done to create this like it's incredible right mm -hmm. yeah it, it is uh, like you said if you've ever done any film editing anyone's ever done that on their own like you realize like wow or, or just making music even to make three minutes yes. of music is so many hours of your Huge. life to do that yeah. it's incredible and it could have taken years to develop that song right yeah. like it starts as an idea and then right. sometimes you sit with it for a long time before it it comes out in, in the final product so yeah yeah it makes such a huge difference um i recently i, I don't know i probably can't say a lot about this but i got to see someone working on an animated film and it was oh, yeah. it was still a work in progress too. So like yeah. all the stuff wasn't completely done, and the, mm. the details weren't there to where you know they're going to be. Um, yeah. But once the music comes in, it's amazing how it just opens up the world, and it yeah. goes from just being stuff moving, which is still impressive, yeah. but to being a world. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And and that and, and that can't happen without the music, and the music can't make it happen without the visuals too. Yeah, There's that totally. They, collaboration they, that needs to happen. They do. They inform each other and influence each other so much, and um, it's really funny actually getting to watch everything without music because obviously I always get a version of it that's right. just got dialogue and SFX and no music, and you just you watch it and you just really really notice you really notice all the gaps and how awkward it feels and and or like you know just just where where there's something lacking and and then when you put the music in it's just funny that um most most people watching films or or television they don't even hear the music they don't even know yeah. like right. sometimes i just say i'm it. a i'm a film composer and they're like what is that? I'm like, oh, I write, write music for film and TV. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess there is music. In. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, like sometimes it just, that, that's sometimes the mark of a great score is you don't notice it. Like it's yeah. serving. It's just, it's just taking you on the journey, but you really notice it when it's not there. And yeah. uh, it's just, it's kind of, it's fun to get to see the transformation and, and feel that impact that you're having on it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. such a good point. Cause sometimes at its best, you don't even notice it. I, yeah. I went to see um, one of the, I forget what movie it was, but it was one of the movies Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross scored. Um, so it might have been like, I don't even remember, maybe the uh, girl with the dragon tattoo or something like that. Okay. You, you yeah. know, um, and I love Nine Inch Nails. So I was going as like a fan, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I got out of the movie and I was like, oh, I didn't even pay any attention to the music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so into yeah. the movie and the like yeah. the overall thing, and I came out. I was like, yeah. "Idiot!" <laughs> you know, like no. you didn't even notice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it did its job, though. Yeah, it did yeah. its job, and and then yeah, and then I I was I'm the same way. I get so lost in the film, but then I. I go and I like listen to the soundtrack after and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is like a standalone masterpiece too. Like, how did I not notice this and this? But <laughs> when you're just absorbed in the the whole product, the whole, the whole collaboration and the whole film, um, yeah, you you're really not thinking about every anything, you know, you're mm. just just experiencing it and just getting lost in that world. So that's really cool. Yeah, and I guess that's what good movies can do is they just take you out of your reality where you yeah everything in your life is kind of gone for a little while yeah and you're just in this you've accepted this world mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier about creating these worlds that especially ones that don't exist that mm -hmm. you have to come up with it's like where do you begin in these mm -hmm. situations when i don't know, maybe there's an example you can think of or um just how do you like what's the first note you play like what, <laughs> like what are you what are you thinking what is it do you jam over it a little bit do you play it like if i if i was doing yeah. it i'd probably loop the scene jam a little yeah. uh, but yeah. i really don't know yeah what other finding like the identity of yeah. a project right when you're coming onto it um is such an exciting process and you know, my my process looks different for every single project. That's the really fun thing. Um, I have um, I have a, a there was an instance where I needed to create a theme song for um, Visionary Gardeners, which was a, a nature television show, and it was all hmm. it was all based in nature. And um, I just surrounded myself with nature. I just went into the woods and. Um, was walking my dog and I heard this bird call and it was like did it did it did it da -da 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 -da. and it did that over and over for like five minutes I just sat there listening to it and I went like it's so rhythmic it's so it's so consistent and so I recorded it with my phone and um and I brought it back to my and, and at this point I'd been you know I'd been kind of playing around on my piano like thinking of palettes and and thinking about what instruments do I want to use what do I and, and nothing was really sticking and any anyway I had this recording and and um I was like well that was just really cool and then that night I went to bed and I um I woke up at four in the morning and I went I went I'm, what what if I use that bird call like that what if, what if I build the whole song around this one bird call? And I was so excited. Mm -hmm. I ran downstairs into my studio and, and, and brought the, the voice memo into my Pro Tool session and like, and just like listened and listened and then started like layering instruments on it, like just percussive and first and then cello. And then everything started with this rhythmic motif. Um, and then, 
it, it just built into the song. It just wrote itself. At that point, I was just like, I just feel like music, it just came, it just came through me and it just happened. And and that was just like a, an instance where it was so unique. Like I really wanted it to come from nature because that was like so much of the program was about connecting with nature and getting back to to our roots and and living in harmony with with our planet and creating more sustainable ways of living and so the fact that the music all came from nature um was really exciting for me but it it looks different for every single project um it, it really depends. And a lot of the time I just try to get as much information as I can. So if it's an animation film, I, I'm just like, I want to see the storyboards. I want to see the um the design, the art palettes, the color schemes, everything, because it all it all helps influence my decisions. Um and if it's or or like the storyline, I wanna help I wanna understand that. And then every single project I start with something different like there is no one process um that I follow you know that I just follow and that's what what keeps me on my toes and what makes this so exciting and I'm always like oh I didn't know I could create that but I just did mm-hmm. and um and so a lot of the time it's distinguishing the the instrumentation the sound palette like that's one of the very first things I'm trying to lock down like where is this world what where what is this genre like? What instruments feel unique and how are we going to create something bespoke? And sometimes it's combining instruments that aren't traditionally combined, like a bassoon and I don't know, um, an electric guitar or a cello, like like just throwing together unique combinations and being like, okay, this is really interesting sound and, and um, trying to think. So sometimes it's like, sound palette sometimes it's rhythmic sometimes it's melody driven sometimes the melody just comes into my head and I'm like I have no idea what instruments I'm going to use but this is the melody that I hear for this story so um a lot of the time it's about getting out of the way of myself and letting the music write itself um I really feel like as a composer it's like I just have to listen I just have to like listen to the story that that you know, whatever project I'm on, what's being told and, and then just like hear what, what kind of comes to me. And, and, and really I do feel like the music passes through me. I, it doesn't feel like something that I'm creating. It feels like something that I'm channeling. And um, the hardest thing to do is get out of the way because as humans, we immediately want to judge it. I start composing and then I'm immediately like, is this right. good? Is this is this going to work? Is this going to fit? And we start like finessing. And so for me, it's like allowing the space for an idea to develop before we write it off or before we judge it too soon. Or, um, you know, it's just just kind of like creating that that space for myself to allow and be comfortable and yeah, and then I get excited about it when some when an idea does come, and then I just it, it just writes itself because I just one thing inspires another thing, and then all of a sudden it's it's just easy, it's so easy to write. Yeah. Well, how do you turn off that critic? Because I know that voice <laughs> all too well, and um, you know, <laughs> it's I don't I don't I don't think up. there is there there is no off switch. That's the really hard thing, hmm. but there is a volume switch. So I find I just try to turn the volume down on it and try to turn the volume up on other things. And that's like the easiest, softest way for me to deal with it. Because as soon as I say like, nope, there's no place for you here. Um, You know, this voice needs to go away. That's like another voice. That's also the egotistical voice. So it's just like ego fighting ego and, um, and, Sorry, I'm getting like a little bit spiritual in in this sense, but that's kind of part of my process is is actually trying to just like be and being like mindful and like connecting to the moment, connecting to music and and turning the volume down on that because once I can just like exist in this moment with music and live in harmony with it, like that that chatter and stuff, um, I can I can turn the volume down on it a little bit. Mm. I can I I don't think there is an off switch. Uh, and sometimes it creeps up, you know, if I'm in a project where like, maybe I am a little bit more out of my depth than I, I normally am that, you know, that voice is a little bit more like yeah. edgier and it's like, it's ready to jump in and go, Oh, you, you weren't ready for this. You should, you know, like it's, it's, it's really right there. And, um, and so it's just something that I try to be aware of. And it's something that I, I've started to like 
talk to myself in this, like, and maybe it sounds crazy, like, cause, cause we work for ourselves. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a freelance composer. So I am my own boss. And I've started to think about that recently where I'm like, if I'm like, no, that sucks. Abandon that, like start over. And I'm like, what if, what if somebody else said that to me? Like, what if I just heard those words from a boss? How would I feel like I would never talk to anyone like that? I would Hmm. never treat anyone like that. So why am I talking to myself like that? So it's actually trying to like reframe the communication instead of being like, that sucks. It's being like, Hey, you know, we're not quite there yet. That's okay. Like, let's, let's try it against more. And like, just like keeping things soft with myself and, and keeping the kindness there because it's, it's easy to, to beat yourself up. It's, it's definitely like, um, I find that's just like a, an easier thing to fall into than trying to lift ourselves up. And so it's just something that I'm conscious of. And it's something that I want to enjoy making music. I don't want to fight with myself. I don't want to, you know, fight these battles and and feel like I'm beating myself up over it. And I've definitely done that in the past. But I've just that's that's how I've come out of it is like I've recognized that I've done that. And and that's the part that I don't enjoy. And I'm like, what if that's just not there? What if? What if I like rewire my brain and pave this new way? And I just think every time I practice thinking this way, that path is getting um, that path is getting clearer and stronger. And the other path is the grass is growing over it. And mm. hopefully, you know, I can eventually just I still have to kind of keep realigning, recentering myself. But I just hope that um, I'm going in the right direction mm. with it. I've heard. I think scientists anyway, if not, um, somebody convinced me that this is scientific, but you know, like the way our brain works is we're constantly making these pathways and and habits and they get routine. And that's why we can, you know, drive to work and not even think about it after a while. Yeah. But I I heard it described as like a ski slope where Mm. every time you go down that path, you're just kind of digging it in a little more and making it more traveled path. But you have to sort of go another way and soon after a while. And I, I do think that works. And It does. I think so too. The first few passes aren't so smooth. No, you're energy. like trudging through. I always find like the visual of like an overgrown meadow helps uh-huh. me. Like, like I'm a very visual person. And I'm just like, the first time you're just like, you can't see the way, you can't see where you're going. You're like, you're just beating the bushes out of the way and you're cut. You're, and it's, and, and it's like, and then it's, You've, but once you've done it once, you're like, oh, I did that. Mm. I can, I could do that again. And then the next time you do it, you trudge down the, and it just, it just really like. Yeah, some of the grass is bent over here. <laughs> hey, it's a time. little bit easier this time. Yeah. yeah. Or like, oh, I remember this. And like, I remember how this feels. And, and I know I'm, I'm, so it does, you know, it does start to feel easier. The more, the more we do it, the more we like treat ourselves kindly instead of bullying ourselves or, or create you know, compassion and, 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 uh, space for ourselves to, to not be perfect because why should we be perfect on the first try? Like we're Mm. human. It's a creative process. It's not going to be the final product when I first sit down and write it. That's okay. No needs to be like upset about it or have judgment there. So it's just, it's just like, we, we just have these unrealistic expectations of ourselves. I think, um, that, we just compare ourselves as a human. Like it's so natural to only listen to the final score of, and and be like, oh, that's incredible. And then listen to your own music. And be like, yeah, that's that's not there. But like, yes, but millions of dollars have gone into their score, and so much time and production and people. And it's like, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's not it's not realistic to expect ourselves to just be perfect right away. And mm-hmm. um, I think it's something that I've definitely struggled with, and I'm sure many artists. Um, beat themselves up over it too so yeah yeah i think it, every time it it yeah. comes up you know and um you're right in that we always see the final product we yeah. don't we don't get to see the like scribbled out notes and the <laughs> deleted files and all yeah. of that stuff that most likely went into it and when we're there we're like what's wrong with us fuck we can't do it mm-hmm. i love the idea of turning the critic down because i think you're right when you try to force it out it's just, that's another thing that you're doing that's yeah. also counterproductive because now you're, you're at odds with yourself. Yeah. Um, I Somebody once said on this podcast, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who, but that they, they think the critic is important because it is there to sort of protect you. Mm, so it, yeah. it's good to have a little judgment, but it doesn't have to be a dictator, I think is what they said. Yes, no, it, I It agree. gets a say, but it's, it's not the dictator. 
there's space for it, but not in the initial creative space, like not in the right. very first, like that's, that's the part of my process that I try to, to cut it out of is like when you're first brainstorming ideas, it doesn't really belong there, but yes, definitely when you're finessing it and fine tuning and, 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 and it's like, yeah, we do need that, that part of our brain. We do need the the part that makes sure it's all logical and mm-hmm. um, yeah, there's more space for it down the road, but I think it just, it can too quickly become a barrier early in the process sometimes. So yeah, early um, on. Yeah. I, I've, I've told some of my students, it's like when you teach a kid a sport, Right, yeah. teach a kid baseball, say, and um, you know they're playing for <laughs> a couple weeks, and then you're disappointed that they're not like Babe Ruth, some famous <laughs> professional. Yeah. It's, you're not Michael Jordan yet, so you're not good at basketball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not fair to that child or that idea. No, you're, you're putting it to a standard that it's just not ready for. And when you say it like that, it sounds so obvious, but it, it doesn't is. feel yeah. obvious when we're doing it to ourselves. Like I remember um, when I first got into film composing, just so upset that my scores didn't sound like Danny Elfman's. <laughs> um, I was just like, you know, how come this isn't like one of the greatest scores ever? <laughs> like, why isn't it there? Um, yeah. And it's just like, okay, I have like zero budget, and I have like, <laughs> you know, not these tools and these, and it's just, it's just, it's really funny that. Um, it it doesn't it doesn't make sense at all but like in our own head at that moment we it's so real we should be there we should be this other thing and we should be better and um it's just it's it's been really really nice to um to develop and grow out of that a little bit and um i just think yeah like mindfulness and keeping my um mental health in check is just as important as my career progression like they go hand in hand you can't have you can't have one without the other well Well, you can have mental health without a career but (laughs) you can't have a career without um without your mental health you know it's a lot harder (laughs) it's you're gonna you're gonna hit uh a barrier at some point and it's gonna be more challenging yeah yeah some meditation has really helped me a lot where and i yeah, I guess it's mindfulness where you're just trying to maybe pay attention to breathing or something you're trying to pay attention to. And then every time you notice you're not, just to, okay, come back to it. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, look at my mind. It just went off. And it has helped me catch myself when I start going down these spirals of negative thinking. It's like you said, we're, we say things to ourselves sometimes that you would never say to your worst enemy. You, no. you, would, you would pull that punch on the yeah. person you hate the most, but <laughs> you're, you're walloping yourself with it all day, every day sometimes. Yeah. And to be able to just kind of catch yourself and, and identify that critic is just a thought. It's just yeah. a thought. Just like, you know, all of a sudden I just thought about a, a rabbit wearing basketball shoes. <laughs> probably thinking of Michael Jordan's Space Jam. But you're, like they're just random almost they're kind yeah. of out of nowhere for the most part you have no control over what the next thought is going to be and mm-hmm. it really it doesn't hold a lot of weight if yeah. you i mean how many times that i'm sure anyone does this where you play out these situations in your head of fake conversations you're going to have confrontations yeah. you're going to have and they never happen the person wasn't even mad <laughs> they went, yeah but, it never goes the way that you expected it like that you've built it up in your head to be this big thing and yeah. absolutely yeah i it's think funny. um it's, at least i saw it attributed to mark twain but it was uh, something like uh in my life i've suffered many great things most of which never happened <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that's a great head. quote yeah. yeah oh my gosh yeah that's so true like these things we mentally prepare ourselves for we run through every every case scenario and every situation <laughs> and it's just like sometimes it's just it's really pointless <laughs> it's just making yourself miserable <laughs> it's yeah it's our way of thinking that we're preparing ourselves for it yeah. but does, is we, are we really like I don't know? It's our way of maybe thinking that we have some control over the situation, hmm. but it's like and you it's know. probably useful. Sometimes it's good yeah. to rehearse and be prepared yeah. for situations. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's easy to get carried away, and I think the critic is the same way, and those yeah. judgmental things and being hard on ourselves about what we're working on. Yeah. I 
I really think it's like a tremendous victory anytime you finish anything, <laughs> you yeah. know, artistic, anytime you follow through. I mean, most people that start at anything creative never finish it. They, mm. in most projects, most ideas never get finished. Um, to even be in that arena of I finished something, I saw an yeah. idea and took it to the end. You're, you're yeah. in, you know, there's not a lot of people in your company. There's not a lot of ideas that get that far. It's it's worth celebrating. And if nothing else, even if it's what you made was terrible, at least you got some <laughs> practice yeah. going on the journey. Yeah. And sometimes you just need a deadline and you just need to to put it put it behind you and move on to the next thing because we can the thing with art is we can just finesse and finesse and finesse it. And sometimes it's like it's done long before, you know, and you just, mm -hmm. it's pointless. You just keep, keep going over the same. And, and we feel so, we do feel like quite protective of it and um, vulnerable, putting it out into the world that it's like, so for me, I actually really love having the deadlines of film and well, television. I was and say, games you must be because it's just like, with deadlines. <laughs> it's just like, once you hit this, like there is no turning back. And having mm. the deadline um, really helps me commit to an idea earlier on because it's like, mm. I don't have time to just like explore a million things always, you know, like especially on TV series where I'm I'm cranking out one episode per week for, you know, I just, I came off a run last year that I did um, um, 50 two weeks straight an, an episode wow. a week of fireman sam and um just starting another one another season this week which will go on for 26 a uh, week straight and it's just like one episode a week you don't have you don't have time second guess you don't have time yeah. to um to you know just doubt there's no space for doubt so it's just like get on with it and i i actually really love that about filming yeah. um and the industry is like uh, you just you commit to things and it's it's nice because you grow and you move on and you just it's out there in the world and then it it serves its purpose mm -hmm. and it does what it needs to do at that point and uh as an artist definitely with my own personal music I just sit on things for way way longer than that and then I actually become removed from it because I, I, when, by the time I'm releasing it, I'm not in the same space as I was when I first created it. And it doesn't like re even resonate on, on the same level. And I'm more excited about what I'm going to create next than what I'm releasing. And, mm. and for me, like that, the, the disconnect there is just like, you know, it just makes more sense to release it when I'm excited about it, even if it's not perfect. It's like, it, it's okay. It can be out in the world and maybe there's something in it that someone will hear and go, Ooh, that sounds like an interesting vibe for my project and like you know it, it it it'll serve its own purpose and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be my my perfect tribute to me as an artist you know like i think yeah. um letting go of perfection i have perfectionism um and most artists we strive we strive to be perfect um but i really just feel like just letting go of that has um created created more opportunities for myself because I get to stay current with where I'm feeling I get to stay true to the art that I want to be working on in that moment and not mm -hmm. like have these things that said there's there's like a million voice memos and half unfinished projects in my library that I just yeah I moved on from it before I finished it and it's like okay well you know that one didn't ever get to see the world and that's okay <laughs> like mm -hmm. I had something else that I felt more passionate about so yeah yeah that's bound to yeah. happen yeah I'm listening to a book. I just started it today. It's it's called Art and Fear. Art mm. and Fear. It's been recommended a bunch of times and I'm finally getting around to doing it. And um, the author said something that I really liked that I was in my car listening to this book and I'm like, I got my little notepad at the light. I'm writing down things to remember. And he said um, l something to the effect of um, leave, leave something left for the next project um i'm not mm. articulating it right but the idea was sort of like you don't have to get it perfect you can that can be the thing you work on for the next project you can leave mm -hmm. yourself something to work on or improve for the next project and yeah. i i just and when he when i heard that i was like yeah you know like it's okay like yeah so i, I gotta finish this thing and mix maybe isn't perfect but yeah, I get that in the next one. I'll get better. I'll have another project to work on that for. And it, it's a nice way of just 
being excited about the next thing and taking a little bit of the pressure off on the thing you're working on. I love that. That's a really nice way of reframing it because that could so easily be a negative sentence that you've actually just put like a nice positive spin on, right? Like, oh, this album didn't have that, but it's like, well, now there's actually an opportunity for me to strive for that um, on the next thing, room for me to grow. And it's just like wherever we can use language to shift something into a positive rather than a negative we um we're just like we're in our own best interests you know we're gonna mm. feel better and language is so powerful the the words that we choose you know um just by reframing the sentence can change change the state of our mind and make something feel welcoming or comfortable so i think that's a really really great one i'm gonna take that one with me <laughs> mm. Yeah, right. Instead of laboring over it forever. And and then you find yourself in that point where you don't care about it as much as you once did, or you don't feel it the same way. Yeah. Um, Get it out there when you're excited and, you know, figure it out the next time. (laughs) It's, I like having missions too. And a lot of the projects I do is sort of like, if this thing turns out terribly, (laughs) at least I'm getting practice with this or I'm learning how to do that. So it's not a loss. Yeah. You know, even if what I'm working on today is garbage, at least yeah. I, I learned a new plugin. I learned, a, yeah. you know, I learned uh, <laughs> something. I figured something, I tried a new scale that I never use or whatever yeah. it might be. That's something it. productive. Yeah. And sometimes, like, <clears throat> we don't need to mark our success by a physical result, you know, like, it's just like, yeah, we showed up and we did it. And, mm. and sometimes that's enough for a day, you know. Sometimes yeah. like letting go of that expectation of there needing to be a result of something um, at the end is just like, that's just like the biggest part. And and actually having that lifted, maybe like you will have a big result because there wasn't all this pressure and expectation to just get there. You just were like, you know, I'll just allow it. But I mean, when the deadlines come in, it's a, it's a bit of a different story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, that's another great motivator though. It, yeah. it forces you to really make decisions. About yes. And, I don't have all the time in the world to worry about this one tiny little detail. That's about 0.1% of the final product. I need to get yeah. the the thing that's 75% done first. <laughs> Definitely, yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's good to impose those and you obviously have no choice in a lot of the work you do. <laughs> And Thank that's, God, that's though. kind of good, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy about it, yeah. Well, that's that's another I reframing, right? I mean, yeah. some people might say, oh my God, I got to do so much. But you say, good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It takes some of the heat off of it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> so I guess we're getting near the end of our time here. Uh, I, you've got your website, amandacauley.com, which is a great mm-hmm. place for people to check out your work. And on your YouTube too, you have a great video um, oh, yeah. describing exactly that thing you were talking about with finding the birds. You, oh, you, know, the you saw the video. Yeah, yeah it was really cool. Yeah. I love that. Um, nice. I love using nature sounds in my music and even just to yeah. establish, like we're talking about making a world, I find a lot of times that puts you somewhere. Yeah. Where the DAW is so sterile, it's mm. literal negative infinity silence when nothing's playing. So sometimes just having something that's just a mm-hmm. space, <laughs> like yeah. sometimes it's nature, sometimes it's even just the sound of a room. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's a cool, it's a cool demonstration of what you did. And you kind of see everybody kind of playing off that rhythm, like on the, ch- I think it was a cello maybe. It um, was, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a guitar, guitar. like tapping yeah, on tapping it. Yeah, tapping on it. Yeah, it was really yeah. cool. I enjoyed yeah. t- too that Thank it was you. like an unusual use of the oh, guitar. That's a bit of a deep cut. I'm surprised you found yeah. that on, it's all on my YouTube page. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, cool. really cool stuff. Um, so I've, I'm going to have links to all this stuff. Is there any place else you want to send people? so they can check out your work? Oh. Get them in the um, show notes as well? Yeah, the main place is just my website. Um, yeah. And Instagram is my main social media platform. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time. This is great. Um, lots of very useful and insightful thoughts about the process. And uh I love yeah. how it kind of, I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, we are talking about music, but it, there's a lot of life stuff that comes into play too here. So a lot of what you said, even I think is just useful in our day-to-day 
mm. experience going through this world. So thank you yeah. a lot for sharing that. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm also like really happy and surprised by the direction that our conversations have gone because yeah. I, you know, had no intention on setting into the like, let's touch on mental health and stuff. But I just think it's it's so cool. It's it, I love talking about this and it is a big part of the process. So thanks for having this space um, for me here to do that today. And uh, thanks to everyone that's listened. I hope that it's um, been enjoyable or served a purpose for you at this time. Yeah, I think it was, it's like a conversational jam session. <laughs> yeah, it was, so, it was. <laughs> it was. It was a good one. So yeah, um, yeah. thanks so much. And thank you, the listener, for tuning in. We hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club, where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.